Hey, beautiful people. This is Alexis Fernandez, the host of the podcast, Do You Fucking Mind? A podcast that teaches mindset hacks backed by neuroscience. This podcast gives you the tools you need to set boundaries, not take shit from anyone, to increase self-love, confidence, and even move on from an ex. I'm also going to teach you how to rewrite hardwired negative self-beliefs. And if you like going deeper into science, I even delve into what effects drugs and neurotransmitters have on your brain. So if you're okay with getting a little bit of tough love and the occasional swear word peppered in there, then this podcast is for you. Join me at the Do You Fucking Mind podcast, mindset hacks for a badass life. Hey everyone, today's guest and co-host is the very funny comedian, actress, writer, and producer, Natasha Legero. Natasha and I talk about her new show, Rat in the Kitchen, the pluses and minuses of dating a chef, what happens to your brain when you watch too much reality TV, Natasha's relationship with an Australian con artist that sounds like reality TV, and a lot more. Our first call today is with Erica, who is looking for answers as to why she's never had a serious boyfriend and wonders how she can improve her dating life. Next, we talk with Edith, who has had a crush on the same guy for over 10 years and thinks it might be time to find out if he feels the same way. They did kiss once. Thank you so much for listening to our podcast and telling your friends about it. If you have a question and would like to talk with us, just look for the link at unqualified.com. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. I can't thank you enough for doing this. I just think you're amazing. I think you're amazing. You're a big inspiration for me. You're such a great actress and you're so funny. You know, it's hard to be a funny actress. I have a unique circumstance because I didn't have any intention of being comedic in any way. Really? Yes, I was really short growing up. I like entered puberty at like 21, essentially. And I just wanted people to take me seriously. So when did you realize, like I read that Reese Witherspoon, I forget what her debut movie was when she was really young, but she said she was so confused when she was at the premiere because everybody was laughing. And she was like, I was just playing it seriously. Did you have that same, like, when did it happen for you where you're like, oh, I'm funny? Oh, I still don't think I necessarily am. I think my face is incredibly active and that's why I can't watch (laughs) playback. (laughs) <laughs> but like how funny, like you didn't think you were being funny? Well, that's fair. I always felt like if I have a comedic sensibility, it comes from sincerity. Mm. If I really believe what this ridiculous person is believing, then maybe that will transfer into comedy. <laughs> well, that's called good acting, probably. <laughs> Thanks, Natasha. Your comedic characters are grounded in reality. That's good. But you're in good company because I just watched the... Amy Poehler, Lucille Ball documentary. And Lucille Ball says, I am not a funny person. I love that. (laughs) But what about you? When did you start to realize? I just remember raising my hand in class and people laughing. And I'm like, why are they laughing at my question? So I think that like, I (laughs) maybe my frankness or willingness to ask any question or wanting to know the answers to odd things. I don't know exactly. Which parent of yours gave you that quality of sort of confidence and maybe cynicism? I don't think either of my parents gave me that, but I do think like you, I was very small. I was like so short my whole life that I feel like I had to overcompensate by being loud and being heard and being seen. And I was never picked for any of the sports. Do you remember that in school, like lining up oh, and then like, I'll take him, I'll take her. I'll take, and then like, it was always me at the end. Oh, it was torture. I know. So in sort of a segue to your show, I used to have a list of men in professions that I wouldn't date. But number four was chef. You're saying you would never date a chef? Yes, I reached this conclusion after watching a few episodes of Hell's Kitchen. (laughs) Well, it seems like it'd be so amazing to have someone cook for you, but I worked as a waitress for like 10 years and the chefs were always yelling and they were emotional like the musicians, but over food. (laughs) 
But I don't know. It's hard because wouldn't you exchange that for like someone cooking for you? I mean, I guess there's Postmates. <laughs> okay, so Natasha, rat in the kitchen. I am really intrigued by the concept of this show. Will you explain it? Well, I host the show and Chef Ludo is sort of the judge, but he also helps me host it. And if you're not familiar with Chef Ludo, he's a French chef. He's got some great restaurants in LA, Petit Trois. His food is amazing and he is really a true artist. And so we host the show and each episode has six chefs ranging from, you know, professional chefs who own their own restaurants to really talented home chefs. And the six of them have to work together to try to make dishes that impress Chef Ludo. However, one of them has been chosen to be a rat, which is a saboteur, someone who's going to sabotage all the dishes. So then once we judge the rounds, if the dish is disgusting and the rat has ruined it, the money goes into the rat's bank. And then if it's good and it impresses us, it goes into the team bank. So then at the end, if the rat has sabotaged enough dishes, they get to go home with all the money. If I was making a dish like a souffle or something and someone substituted sugar for salt, I would feel emotional about it. Yes, that has happened. And a lot of these chefs like idolize Chef Ludo and, you know, their dream is to impress him. And then someone has sabotaged it. Oh, my God. I would be in tears. (laughs) I would be quiet about it because I'm proud and embarrassed. But, yeah, I would imagine. I mean, definitely people were upset. And I was happy that they let me just make jokes. You know, comedians, we are the diffusers. So just being able to be there... It's like, you know, when my parents were fighting when I was little, you know, I'm just kind of there to like make sure everybody's okay and still having a good time and kind of roast them and that kind of thing. (laughs) Did you have a large group of friends in high school? I didn't have a large group of friends. I had like two friends. So we were kind of a trio and I grew up in Rockford, Illinois. So we would always like sneak to Chicago and go see bands. And we always wanted to like be with people who are older than us. And like, I didn't go to my prom. I think I pretended to go to my prom so my mom wouldn't be mad. But I was never really that interested in high school. I was kind of more interested in growing up and getting out of high school. I do feel like there's been a shift like My whole life, I just always wanted to be older than I was. Even now, I'm like ready to be on the Golden Girls. I'm just like too young. I've always wanted to like be older and more sophisticated. So whatever is the obsession with youth, it never really affected me. I always want to talk to elders. I'm more interested in what do the 80-year-olds have to say? (laughs) Do you have a guilty reality pleasure? Yes. Well, I love Hell's Kitchen, I have to say. Yeah. I definitely watch that with my husband. And any cooking show I'm usually kind of down for. There's a certain type of reality show I put on, and I do feel my brain cells just starting to float away. And it does feel like they kind of make you stupider if you get too into it. I've watched pretty much all of them, and that's definitely true. Moshe and I were watching Love Island, and then... We were watching the British Love Island, and then we started to see, like, wait, there's, like, 35 more episodes, and we've watched already eight. And, like, the British seasons of that show were so many episodes. There's always a new episode on some reality show. I keep thinking I could have invented something by now or at least read War and Peace a few times. Um, Natasha, will you tell us about a heartbreak and how you got over it? Well, there was a big one when I was like 22. I dated this guy who was like in his 40s in New York. And then he took me to Australia. I gave up my rent stabilized apartment to be with him. And then as I got to Australia and everybody was very concerned about me, it started to slowly unravel that this man was lying about everything. And he was kind of a con artist and he wouldn't really let me answer the phone or leave the house. Wait, wait, wait. Was he Australian? Yes. I meet him in New York at my waitressing job. He's like, come to Australia to be with me. So I just decided to do it after like we had this email love affair. And then when I got there, all these crazy things started happening. He would be like, oh, I need to go meet this friend and that friend. And then all of a sudden, one day, this girl shows up at the house and she's like, he impregnated me. He owes me $5,000. You know, like very dramatic. 
Were you alone in the house or was he there? He was like outside in a fight with some bouncer that she brought. Like it was just really bad. Oh, and then she wanted my money. She was like, I need $1,200 to pay for my abortion. And so like I ended up giving her my university money to like pull this guy out of the trouble he got into. It was a terrible situation. It lasted like a year. I then ended up getting money from my mother to help him come back to New York with me after like I knew he was cheating on me. (sighs) And it drove me so crazy. I just had this memory of being so frustrated with him because he was older than me. Obviously, he had all these brain tricks and I would just be like, I know you're cheating on me. And he would just repeat, I was with no one. I was with no one. I was with no one. And I remember he just kept saying I was with no one that I got so mad, I banged my head against the bathroom floor. I mean, I wasn't bleeding or anything, but I had just never been that frustrated before. And it was a really sad situation. But when I look back on it, it was pretty funny to me. And also just because he was such a nut. And I'm just so grateful that that happened to me when I was so young, because I'm sure people get into situations like that in their 30s and 40s and then have babies with these people. So mine just got to be this like blip. What an odd thing, though. It's not like typical gaslighting in the sense of you're just crazy or you're young and you don't know anything. Yeah. And it's like you always kind of know that they're lying because when I was in Australia with him, he was like, no, I'm going to go with this friend and this friend. I can't introduce you to them yet. So every time he left, I would then go through his things because I was like, something's weird. So then I remember him telling me that his dad was a doctor on a ship. And then I like dug through some of his stuff and I saw that his dad was like a factory worker. It said like electroplater. Like I found his birth certificate. Like I was always trying to find clues and then I would find the clues, but then still stay with them. (laughs) So how did it end? And how did you break free? It was really hard. I like took him back to New York and then we were like living in this apartment and I just felt so weird about it. And then finally, I think he left me for a girl in Brooklyn with an inheritance because his whole thing was like grifting off of women to just get whatever money they had. It wasn't like he had some grand scheme. I'm going to steal from these heiresses, but I'm sure he was like trying to find an heiress. He definitely got money from me and my mom and we didn't even have any money. So, yeah, he finally found some girl. And then I think it just kind of went away. Were you hurt or were you at that time like numb and self-protective? I was definitely hurt. And like he was always telling me, oh, my mother would have approved of you. You have such small ankles. She was a friend of the aristocrat. (laughs) And it's my fault for getting into this relationship because when I was 21, all I wanted, like I said, was to be sophisticated. So I found this guy who was like, my mother is an aristocrat and oh, don't drink that wine, drink this wine. And we're going to go to the Algonquin. And, you know, it was like all about being fancy. And, you know, that's the only thing he had. He wasn't a good person or an honest person. And he didn't cherish me or know how to treat me. And he was like verbally abusive. And we would get into so many fights. And his whole thing was, you know, that's not the right knife to butter the marmalade. You can't use a steak knife for the marmalade. And then he wouldn't talk to me or like I would open the window and he's like, you opened it too far. That's not civilized. Windows should be open a quarter of an inch or, you know, like he just had all these crazy ideas. He just acted like a prince all the time. And I think that that really seduced me, even though he was a horrible person. Well, I'm so glad that he fucking broke up with you. (laughs) I mean, it could have been a whole other journey. So that must have infiltrated you on some level, right? Well, yes, because I was really poor when I first moved to LA. And I think I kind of adopted his persona, which was acting like you are fancy no matter what. I remember once we were on the bus in Australia and he asked the driver, does this bus go to Bondi Beach? And the driver goes, read the sign. And the guy, my boyfriend was like, are you assuming, sir, that I can read? (laughs) And he used to call me Wiener. He's like, Wiener, we're getting off the bus. And he would like make this big stink like we were in a Grey Poupon ad, even though we're like on the bus. And he just would make these big deals out of nothing and just act like he was royalty no matter what. 
And so like, I think I kind of was influenced by that when I first got on stage, you know, just trying to think that you were like New England money, even though your convertible, the top didn't shut all the way. And LA's like ripe for this mentality in general, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> Totally. So he prepped me. <laughs> Do you like Los Angeles? I love it. It really is a beautiful place. And once you get a friend set, and I think the pandemic was really hard, but before the pandemic, I feel like comedians, we just had this built in social network of like, you go out every night or five nights a week. And, you know, you see these people, hopefully you respect and are funny and had damaged childhoods like yours. And you all (laughs) kind of get the dark side of things. And just having that built in social network, I feel like maybe it might not be the tip experience of LA. Hey, Erica. Hi, how are you? Oh, great. Thank you so much for writing in. Will you tell us what's going on? Yes, I will. So I'm about to turn 26 here in a couple of weeks, and I've never had a serious boyfriend. So the last couple of years, I've been on countless dates, and I've put a ton of effort into dating. I'm frustrated because I see everyone else my age settling down and finding their person. Meanwhile, I'm still going on multiple dates a week and cannot find someone who wants to stick around for more than a handful of dates. Right. There have been lots of dates where I don't feel a connection or a spark right away, and I'm very honest and straightforward about it. However, whenever I do start to like someone and see potential with them, they usually tell me after four or five dates that they don't feel a connection. I want to continue dating because I know I will not find my person if I don't put myself out there. However, I'm exhausted and I don't know how to approach dating anymore. Especially dating now with dating apps, I feel like exhausted is the word that people use most frequently. So Erica, when you were in high school and younger, what sort of prevented you, I guess? I mean, you're lovely. You're from, gorgeous. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I mean, I dated in high school. I had a few boyfriends, but never anything more than like a few months. But in like college and after college, I've just... I don't know. I've just focused on myself. So I didn't really try to date. But then the last few years, I've really just been putting myself out there. And yeah, I just haven't been able to. My initial thoughts are these. The idea of the societal pressure that we all have, you know, especially for women, babies and marriage and sort of like these milestones that we're supposed to have and accomplish. Did you feel that, Natasha? I did not. But I will say, you know, you're 26. Just to put it in perspective for you, I got married at 40 and had my kid at 42. So I'm not saying that that's the right way to do it either. But 26 is like, I think I was still recovering from my love affair in Australia when I was 26. And like... (laughs) I think that just because your friends are all finding their one doesn't mean that that's the path you're on. And it also seems like you have this kind of rumination that's happening. It's like, this is the same old story. I go on four dates and then they tell me I'm not. It's like you need to somehow pick the needle up off that record that's just playing in your head. And one way to do that is to kind of like switch gears a little bit. And maybe that means taking a little bit of time off. Like, have you ever written a list of everything that you think is great about you? Like if you were just going to be the most generous person, like, having that list in front of you of the things that you know are true, having that. And then also what I do, and this is why it took me so long to find my partner is like making a list of what I want in a partner. And that's why it's so good to date around and have boyfriends because you can start to see like, oh, I thought he was the one, but actually he had a problem with me shining. And that's a non-negotiable for me, you know, like knowing what are the non-negotiables and what are the things that you'd like, but they're not necessary. Like I used to have a list where I was like, you know, I'd like a British guy, but okay, that's not a non-negotiable. Or I'd like a musician or someone who could play guitar, but okay, that's not a non-negotiable, you know, but like, 
someone who makes their own money. I need to have that because I didn't have that for like a five year relationship. And I was like, uh, uh, this sucks. I'm never doing that again. So I just think like taking a month off maybe and really kind of feeling yourself and, you know, just taking a little bit of stock in what you really are going after and also taking the pressure off yourself because 26 is like, come on. Are most of the guys you're going out with, are they like in your age range? Usually like around my age, maybe a couple years older. Because guys in their 20s and other ages too, but especially in their 20s, they can be pretty focused on just having a good time instead of looking to be in a committed relationship. But when one of the guys you like isn't as reciprocal, how do you absorb that? Yeah, I used to take it a lot more personally, but now it's kind of gotten to the point where I'm like kind of expecting it, I guess, just because that's what I'm used to. But I'm learning to not take it so personal just because I'm realizing it's not me. It just hasn't been the right person. What about the people that you've rejected? Like, can you give us an example of a day that you went on where you're like, okay, that was the non-negotiable for me? Yeah. Tell us what dating is like. (laughs) (laughs) I went on a date like a couple weeks ago. And well, first of all, he wanted to meet at Chipotle and split a bowl of Chipotle. (laughs) Romance. (laughs) Love romance. Yeah, he said that ahead of time, but I didn't know what to say. So I just said, sure, because I didn't know really even how to go about that. But anyways, it ended up being a nice day. We ended up just going on a walk instead. And he wanted to hold hands. And I don't know, I guess I was just like, this is our first date. I felt a little uncomfortable with that. And I don't know, maybe I'm being too picky, but those couple of things just turned me off (laughs) from the start. Holding hands is weirdly intimate, though. And did he call you again? And did you say, I don't think this is... Yeah, yeah. But see, you kind of wasted your time in a way because, I mean, Chipotle, like you already knew that like that was not the meat cute that you... Yeah, that's true. I guess I'm trying to be less picky and not have like small things bother me, but that was kind of just in my head the whole time. I was working with this woman. She was older and beautiful and like successful. And she told me that she went out on this date and this guy like ate food off of her plate and how that was like, no way. And I remember thinking like, well, gosh, if that person is like kind of funny and charming, is that endearing? And I'm sure in her case, there was a lot of minutia to the story that I didn't get. But I did think about are certain people so used to the pattern of being single that they want to find and then kind of nurture that? Because even though society and their friends and family are like, oh, why are you still single? I got a great guy to set you up with or whatever. Something inside of her was like, you know what? I don't know if I want to be in a relationship right now. But I do wonder if there is a little bit of sabotaging because something inside of you maybe doesn't fully want like a full-time boyfriend right now. Or believe you deserve it. What do you think, Erica? I mean, it could just be that, you know, I've never really had something like that. So I don't know, like maybe I just don't believe that I deserve it. And I am kind of self-sabotaging just because I assume that nothing's going to work out since it hasn't in the past. I don't know. Well, I have a friend who's like gorgeous. She's a playmate and she cannot get a guy to keep dating her. And then I started looking at the kinds of guys she dates and they're all like the hottest guy. They always have pictures of their abs. They always are like, you know, tanned and wearing a fedora and at the club. Yeah, they don't want a girlfriend. Right. So it's like you got to also look at like what is this pool of men that you're attracted to. Is there a common thread? And also, is there any other themes or you're like, oh, that's like the second guy to act weird when I brought up blank. Like, is there anything like that that's happening Like, are you telling them all how many kids you want on the first date? (laughs) No, definitely not. I don't know. I mean, it could be kind of like the opposite. Like, I don't really open up much just because I expect it's not going to go anywhere. So it's like, how much do I want to tell you? Yeah, it's not easy to open up and be vulnerable. But maybe it's worth a try with one of these guys that seems like he might reciprocate. Are you mostly online dating? I feel like it's been a 
pretty solid mix. I definitely do some of the like dating apps. Otherwise, like I always have friends trying to set me up or I don't know, I do a lot of social stuff. So just meeting people out and about. What is it about your life right now, do you think, that makes you want a boyfriend? Because maybe it's just simply people telling you that you should have one right now. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it is mostly just most of my friends all having boyfriends. I would try to get rid of that feeling because everyone's on their own path. And you'd probably be better suited like if there was anything you were thinking that you'd like to get into more or do more of or any passion or any career thing. Following that right now, because you're so young, I feel like that is where the juice will come from. And then, you know, meeting someone who you actually organically have something in common with, as opposed to like a guy you meet online who wants to meet at a fast food restaurant and then like weirdly <laughs> hold your hand. It's just like, that would freak me out. And Erica, you went to college? Yeah. So you're in this structure of like goal finding. Like here's the accomplishment of graduation. Here's the first job. Here's the first apartment. And now it's like boyfriend time. That's a lot of pressure. And it's also probably why, from what I gather, like maybe you go into a date viewing it as a chore, like kind of a workout and feeling not super excited about it. Yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah. So it might just not be your path right now at this very moment. Like the 20s are all about selfishness and discovery. It's like you lost the pressure of college. So now the next pressure is like, find a boyfriend. It's time. Everybody's getting married and I'm a bridesmaid once again and blah, blah, blah. So I wish I could remove that pressure. I bet you guys are like, because you kind of have this negative rumination happening when you're meeting them, there's no way people don't sense that. And that's why I was like, maybe you can write a list of all the things that are great about you and just remind yourself about how cool you are. And like, hopefully that can help you relinquish a little bit of the need or the thirst for it to like happen now and happen in the same way it's happening for your friends. You know, like that could maybe come across cloying subconsciously. I don't know how you act on dates, but you know, I think that people can sense it. Dating should be fun. And if it doesn't feel fun, then I think table this for a minute. But when you go out on dates, what percentage of the talking do you do? Good question. Maybe like 30%. I mean, I can be kind of shy, but I don't know. I've gone on so many dates now that I'm getting better at talking more. (laughs) But I feel like at the beginning, I usually would just kind of show up and expect them to do most of the talking. But then I realized, you know, it might come off as I'm not interested. So I'm just getting more comfortable with talking and being more open. I'd like to see Erica take a little more initiative on her dates. Yeah. You know, because the guys are used to probably going out with really talkative women because most of us are pretty talkative. An interesting idea might be, like Natasha was suggesting, like if you have a series of 10 questions that are like, do you collect anything? Or like specifics about your favorite country that you've been to. Things that would give you a place to feel a little more proactive in the date. It might make it more enjoyable. Because you don't need to sell yourself. And it sounds like you don't, which is what I bet a lot of those guys are used to. If they've been on all the dating sites, the idea of like, I hope they like me and I'm going to sell myself like this is probably what they're used to. So if you are quiet and observant, they may take that, though, as you're not into this at all, which maybe you're not which is fine too. But I do want the experience, if you do want to date for a while, I want it to be enjoyable for you. So maybe having like that pocket list of questions. Nothing too heavy. I like the few examples that you gave out. I feel like I do kind of like have go-to questions, but they all just seem kind of repetitive from date to date. But I feel like the examples you gave are more interesting, I guess, and different than like what everyone else is talking about. I think, Erica, you could also think of this more as like a fun experiment dating and experiment a little more with taking initiative even from the beginning. Like if I were dating, what I would do is I would try to make people meet me at things I already wanted to do, like either a walk because I wanted to get exercise or a cafe that I thought was cute that I knew that I liked or going to an exhibit, meet me in line at this 
gallery and we'll go walk through the exhibit or, you know, just kind of something I already wanted to do on my own. So I'm not wasting my time and see if they can hang. And you're not lonely, right? No, I think it's just more like societal pressures. And, you know, my friends and family always, every time I see them, just asking about my dating life. Oh, my God. Yeah. Tell them truly, I talked to these two actresses and (laughs) I've decided that I'm going to wait until I'm 36 (laughs) to get married. So you can throw a dude my way every now and again or whatever, but... (laughs) You know, just keep expectations low. I am very happy being a bridesmaid. (laughs) I love that. Because then, you know, it's cliche, of course, but the idea of like, if you stop looking, then something will come your way or whatever. Right. But there is a degree of truth to that. But you may not want it. You know, I think you're doing beautifully just as you are. Thank you. Yeah, truly. Erica, thank you so very much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm super excited I got to talk to you guys. I'm so appreciative of you. Thank you for writing in. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye. Erica. She was so sweet. I know. No one needs a boyfriend. No one needs the pressure of getting a boyfriend. I knew a girl once who was a virgin and she was like 27. And I think it just started to put so much pressure on her. It was like, now she's 28 and a virgin. Now she's 29 and a virgin. I can't be 30 and a virgin. So it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. And you get adjusted to the patterns of your life. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to talk with Edith. Hi, Edith. Hi. (laughs) Natasha is here and she is just awesome. She gives amazing advice. Edith, will you tell us what's going on? Yes, of course. So I've had a 10 plus year crush on my cousin's cousin. I love your amendment in the letter too. It was like, (laughs) Listen, just to be clear, we're not related. (laughs) Yes, yes. So just the backstory. We have a mutual cousin. I'm related to my cousin through the dad's side and he's related through the mom's side. So we initially met when I was still a senior in high school and he had enlisted in the army at the time. So this was like 10 years ago. And he would sort of come home and visit often. And I met him one day and... (laughs) we started hanging out more often and so well we would hang out as a group kind of thing and then one thing led to another and we kissed one time nothing ever went any further than that not even these last 10 years so I've never forgotten that kiss we were drunk you know dancing and all that so (laughs) and so after that we stopped talking from like 2012 to like 2019, we lost communication. We just sort of all went our different ways. I still kept in contact with my cousin, but we went so long without talking until a couple years ago when our mutual cousin sort of brought us back together. And we started to hang out more often since the pandemic started. And it's always kind of been a group thing. And then sometimes it would be just one-on-one with us. And there was a little bit more flirting when it would be just me and him. (laughs) And so I sort of dropped the bomb a couple months ago and I moved out of state. So I don't know if like this is worth waiting another 10 years or just letting it sort of fizzle out. (laughs) What does your cousin think? I've tried to get things out of my cousin, but he won't share much. And I know they talk about me because sometimes conversations come up and They've talked about me before, but it's just dry with my cousin. (laughs) Gotcha. Okay. Because I was thinking like if he was really supportive, then we all get on board with this. Well, you definitely don't want to wait another 10 years. I mean, he's shy. He's not going to be like coming forward. And, Mm -hmm. you know, does he know you like him? Does he know you have a crush on him? No. So I think that you kind of need an answer if this is something that he would ever think about or Mm -hmm. entertain. And whether that comes from like going to your cousin or you directly, I think it'd be kind of nice for you to know if he was like, I am so sorry, but I just don't think of you that way. Don't you want to know that? 
I do. But at the same time, like I recently moved to another state and my crush, he was without hesitation that he's willing to come and visit on his own. Amazing. So he likes you. <laughs> this is fantastic. So you guys have both been hesitant. It sounds like. Now, was he married or was he like in a long relationship? So that's another thing is between me and him, a topic of discussion of significant others has never been brought up. That's something that we've never talked about. Do you have his phone number? I do, yes. Okay, good. Do you guys ever text? Like, what was your last communication? It was two weeks ago, and I will never initiate text because I feel like I have more feelings in this. I don't want to start my 30s with heartbreak. (laughs) Career-wise, and I'm in a new place, and I'm just like, I don't want to do this if I'm in another state and he's in another state, and I'm just like... No, this has been somebody you've been thinking about for a decade. Yes. It's already been long distance. (laughs) Yes, yes. There has to be some sort of thing that, why did we come back together? Like, there had to have been some sort of sign that... All these years we lost touch and were reconnected. And our last conversation was just something mundane, like, are you homesick? And I was like, no, I just miss my nephew. (laughs) Another thing is that we really connected with the outdoors. So that's another reason why he's really into coming and visit, like without hesitation. I don't know, like, I'm just excited, but I keep thinking of it. (laughs) Okay, worst case scenario that he's like, I don't think about you like that. Mm -hmm. If that is the case, then you may have romanticized him a little bit. However, I'm getting the feeling that that won't be the case. What if the next time you're on like the most gorgeous hike, take a picture and send him the picture? I love this idea already. So find like the most beautiful vista, send him the picture and just keep it light when you come in or whatever. And then at least you don't have to be like, hey, I've been thinking a lot about us and, you know, keep it light. Totally. You're giving him a little bit of impetus to write back (laughs) and see what happens. I mean, you can make a little bit of a move. I'm like you too. I'm kind of old fashioned just because it was ingrained in me. But, you know, I think there's ways of flirting that aren't like asking them out. And he is kind of shy. So (laughs) I think you just make a move like that and see what you get back. You guys are so right. Like something you mentioned is heartbreak. Like I have definitely gone through heartbreak before. And that's another thing why I'm nervous about it. But at the same time, maybe it's just the 30s that I'm not afraid of it anymore. Like, yeah, that's (laughs) great about being in your 30s. It's like, oh, some of these hang ups I'm starting to shed. Yes. I mean, you move on. I think I would be more heartbroken if I didn't say something in 30 years. Totally. Yeah. And what I like about sending someone a picture is like, it has romantic undertones. Mm. It's like, oh, look, remember you love nature. I remembered you love nature. Mm. Look how beautiful it is here. Come here. It says so much without you having to like say the words. I love that. And you'll get a lot of information really quickly. You know, if he texts back quickly, Mm -hmm. that's a big indication. If he is engaging with your level of tone, those are all like the doors are open. He is feeling the same way. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't stay with you if he came up, though, would he? Yeah. So the thing is that I've stayed at his place, but we've slept like on separate beds. So I don't know if there's still a boundary between him or I don't know if he has a significant other. There's always just tension in the room. You guys have chemistry. (laughs) Yeah. And it sounds like you guys are both reserved. Yes. Yeah. So this is wonderful. I think I can't wait. I think something good is going to happen, Edith. I can feel it. (laughs) Me too. I hope. You've been smiling this whole time, Edith. Yes. And the thing is that I think about him a lot. I just don't know how I should tell him or if it's just like little hints through text how Natasha was mentioning. Like, Yeah. Also, do you trust your cousin? Because you do have this liaison. And if you really do trust your cousin or even not, you can just tell your cousin, like, I'm so excited. I would love for him to come. Mm. But you just have to make sure your cousin's in on it and doesn't want to like not have you guys get together for whatever reason. So I wouldn't rely on that. Mm -hmm. I don't know the situation. Mm. Well, I think my cousin is also reserved and shy and stuff. So he sort of is just there. I hope he doesn't come with him. That's another thing. It's like, I hope he comes on his own. Like, because my cousin has also wanted to come and visit, but that's like towards the summertime. And I'm just like, hopefully this doesn't make it more awkward. Yeah. 
I had that happen to me once. That was rough. <laughs> I was working in Vancouver. My new boyfriend brought his roommate to visit me. Ugh. It was just uncomfortable. Mm. It made me feel like he didn't really like me. That's what I'm thinking. It's like every time my cousin tags along, it's like maybe I'm just making this all up in my head and I'm the one with the feelings and he's just like definitely friend. I'm assuming that everybody's in their 30s now. Mm -hmm. So there's a small red flag there if your cousin somehow is put in this chaperone friend position. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that we were hanging out more often during these last two years when I moved home. So it was just like, oh, let's make it the three of us. It was just like ugh, frustrating a little bit. I think that a goal could be like gently vocal with that idea. Okay. Test the waters or whatever. It'll tell you something. I'm not quite sure what if they both come to visit. You only have room for one person at your house. I do. <laughs> there you go. Oh, I'm really excited for you, Edith. Please, please let us know what happens. Thank you so much. Like, I loved your advice. I love Put it. Put yourself out there, Edith. It's a whole new you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I will. I will. Definitely. Thank you so Good. much. Bye, Edith. Bye. Natasha, do you know who the rat in the kitchen is? <laughs> do they tell you? They don't tell me. So it's like a surprise for me and Ludo. So we're sort of like in on the murder mystery. And you're looking at everyone suspiciously. I like that. Yeah, it made it more fun for us, for sure. Do you think you would make a great detective? Make a great detective and a horrible chef. I love it. <laughs> Thanks again, Natasha. 